Drew York Show, live from the ISO Radio studio in beautiful Toronto, Ontario. It's uh, one of two now beautiful days in the city, um, and I have a really special guest today. Um, she not only is a fellow, I guess, like storyteller and host and I don't know, a bunch of other stuff. Um, Alicia, please come sit down. Um, yeah, it's funny. Now I have Ace like, in the place for real. <laughs> Ace in the place! Thank you for doing this. No problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I knew like as soon as as soon as we met, like as soon as we first like kind of got started talking and stuff, I like knew that I wanted to have you on the show because I just feel oh. like you have like a really unique perspective than most people that could have on the show, like, especially from here. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we should like make sure that it's on the record that like the first time that we actually like spent any time together that you like stuffed me in basketball. Oh yeah, for sure. Like made like a total fool. Not I mean I was making a fool out of myself. It's not like <laughs> you didn't need to do that for me, but I didn't do it on purpose. But that's what happens when you want to step on the court with me. Like <laughs> I don't care if you're a boy, you gonna get this work too. Okay, you gonna get it even more. I'm definitely throwing elbows. Like <laughs> it's not gonna be easy <laughs> just because I got some long nails. <laughs> um, you grew up in Toronto, right? Yes, Mississauga. Oh, Mississauga. Yeah. Um. I usually ask people this because it's a lot of my guests like it's music related. Mm -hmm. um, what was your first introduction to music? Do you remember like how early you were yeah. like, introduced to music? Um, I feel like music has always been around my household. Um, although I got a white mama, she still used to wake up on Saturday morning and play soca and blast like soca and dance hall. Wow! So that was definitely something I woke up to regularly on a Saturday morning um so yeah like I've always been really into music I know she used to have like records vinyls I don't know why she never had anything to play it on but she used to have all these vinyls I used to go through them um and then I started collecting my own CDs I think my first CD ever was I, okay, my first time my mom ever or anybody in my family ever bought me like music, it was actually cassette and it was a Backstreet Boys. And it was like Amazing. in that time when we were going from cassettes to like CDs. So CD players weren't that popular and they were expensive. Um, so yeah, my first one ever was like Backstreet Boys. And then my first CD ever was probably either Monica or like NSYNC or something like that. I don't know. So yeah, I was really into pop and like R and B growing up. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> Does that? Do you think that's like sort of had this like lasting influence? Because I know that you're still into like R and B music and like. Yeah. No, definitely. Like, um, I don't listen to as much pop as I yeah. used to listen to. You. Um, but yeah, definitely like the the R and B. I, I will most likely go to an R and B track before I go to a hip hop track nowadays. Um, just because, like, that's when my mom even, outside of, like, Soka and Dance Hall, she was really into the Mariah Carey's, Tony Braxton's, like, mm. all of that. So, Boys and Men, her favorite. Um, mm. <laughs> so, yeah, like, anything, like, R&B, for sure, that was, it was it for me. Yeah. Um, it's funny, I feel like most people that be watching this now would know you from um, being on Flow now. Yeah. Um, but you've had like this kind of like interesting path to getting to being a radio host, which like didn't start yeah. as a radio host at all. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> um, can you tell me about how you first got to move from Canada to New York City and like why, how that even come together? So do you even want to say like, what? there's so much to my story. So bef you want me to share how I got from here to New York or? Yeah, how did that even, like, how do you even know that that was a possibility? Like, how did that even start? Um, okay, well, I used to work for an ad agency. I was in the advertising world, and um, I ended up getting fired, right? And I knew that I wanted to work in radio, but it just wasn't working out because the way that the radio market is set up in Canada, there's not that many options for, like, urban music. Um so I just felt like I was failing and I didn't know if moving to like this small city in Alberta or whatever, BC was just for me. 
Yeah, that seems like the Humber option, eh? Like, a, like I know a lot of my friends that did yeah, radio in Humber, Humber would be they like... they push you so much. They're like, if you're going to work in radio in Canada, you have to go and move somewhere yes. random, work the way up to the top there, and yeah. then you can get work for it from the bottom here. Yeah, so they kept pushing me to do that, and so I just didn't feel like that was possible, so I worked in advertising. And so when I got fired, I was like, okay, like, let's get back on that track and try to uh, get a, a, a job in entertainment or radio or whatever, right? And so I was on Instagram. Um, this was in 2000, what was it, 16? Yeah, so I just started following maybe like a few months before this girl named Gia Peppers. Um, my friend told me to follow her. And so days before the audition for the Ween Academy, she posted the flyer saying like, hey, there's this opportunity if you're between the ages of like 18 to 26 um new york we're having an audition like other people who have been a part of the the industry work everywhere um in the program it's like a four-week program for women who work in entertainment it's called women empowerment women in entertainment empowerment network and um you pretty much go to new york and they'll take you to like all these different places so i saw that i was like okay dope i'm 26 years old this will be my last year to do it wow it's in three days were there Am any other I going Canadians? to New York or no? No. So I'm actually the first international like student and graduate from the Wayne oh. Academy, which is crazy because this year they actually accepted a girl from Chile and um, and Greece. Wow. So like yeah, nobody that everybody was like American. Most of them were from like the D.C., Philly, that kind of area. Um, wow. And so I hopped on a bus. I told my mom. I was like, Mom, I think I'm just gonna go to New York. That like 10 hour Greyhound? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to go to New York and audition for this thing. And she was like, Alicia, why are you going to do that? You don't have a job. Oh, and that's the thing. When I got fired, I said I'm not going back to work until I get a job. So I spent a whole like year and a few months with no job, like yeah. doing nothing. <laughs> like I did some like program biz start. Um, but yeah, so I hopped on the bus. I went to the audition. It was crazy. Like we had to be out there for eight or nine a.m. on a Saturday. It was kind of cold because it was in April. We had to line up around the block, and these the alumni were going around asking us questions. And what I didn't know is that they were actually testing us. And so the first question they asked to me was like, "What are the founders' four names?" And I couldn't remember their names. Like I could visually see them because I was just on the website. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't remember names. And I'm like, I'm, I was like, yeah, Valicia. And I think there was one, Christy. And I just couldn't remember the names. And so I ended up getting this sticker on my piece of paper. I find out later, once we go in, that we all, whoever got the questions wrong or whatever, or didn't have everything, like your resume, your headshot, et cetera, you got cut. So I actually got cut, like, right away. It was the Whoa. craziest experience i was like did i just hop on this bus spend 12 hours to get here just to be cut within a half an hour i didn't even get to shine what that's how did, what even happened how did you even like so they, how do you pivot from that i mean me in my head i was just like i, I can't believe alicia you like dropped the ball this is all your fault and you're thinking w- like you're 26 yeah. this is like the last and like, yes the i was here. like you had one shot and you missed it what yeah. would MJ say about that? <laughs> um, so they ended up taking us to this next room, and it was called the Second Chance Room. And they like somebody came in and was like, "You guys, I'm so disappointed in every single one of you. You guys like fumbled it already. You guys weren't prepared. This is a point of it. Like you have to be prepared." And and they pretty much said, "This is a Second Chance Room." They had a a panel of like five people, and they're like, "You guys get to do your elevator pitch in 30 seconds." And they'll judge on the spot whether or not you get <laughs> you get back in. And you're like freaked out because you just thought that you're like ended it yes. forever. So there's a lot of emotions <laughs> going on through my head at that time. But that moment was like very pivotal for my life in general. It made me realize that like I will never go into a room, an office, whatever, without knowing who might be there. Yeah. So like whenever people hit me up, like what's your advice on the Ween Academy or whatever, or what's your career advice, et cetera, know who's going to be in the building. Like, do your research beforehand. Like, know who the president is. Know who the head of the marketing department is, especially if you're applying to those positions, because you never know when you'll, like, cross by them 
and like you know need to know who that person is right yeah so i always give that advice now because that moment was crazy like if i didn't have that second chance room then i would have not to say that i wouldn't have been here but a lot of my experiences yeah. to this day wouldn't have happened right and so yeah like i got three out of five judges to vote me in it was like yes yes no no and i was like oh <laughs> y'all gonna do this like, i was so nervous like America's got talent. <laughs> yes and then the last guy was like yes and i was like hallelujah thank you jesus that's crazy um but yeah that experience was just crazy <laughs> I ended up going through the rest of the day, the longest day ever. We went until like three o'clock, had to like audition in front of the founders, pitch yourself over and over again. Girls were crying. It was so much, but I finally got accepted. We actually had to wait a couple of months. Usually they tell you there who gets accepted, but what we didn't know is that we were about to film for a reality show too, like a pilot. Yeah. Oh. And so they were doing another part in Atlanta. They were having their another audition in Atlanta. And these were like secret girls. So it was just like, we had to wait a while. I didn't find out that I made it until the day Prince died. Yeah, I found out Prince died. I was walking home. And that's when I also found out that I got accepted. So that was a high, low huh. emotions. <laughs> That's like a day you probably never forget now. No, it was yeah. like Prince dies. Oh, yeah, you're accepted to Wien uh, Academy and you're moving to New York in a month or two months or whatever it was. But yeah. Wow. Okay, so what kind of experience did that? Because I know that, that once you had sort of gotten all these experiences, mm -hmm. that you. Um, okay, yeah, so what, yeah, what, what kind of experiences did it like? Because I know that eventually you were able to move to like working in American radio. Yeah. So with the Wien Academy, um, like I said, it was a four-week program in the summertime, right? And every single day, we would go to different offices. So I think with my time, I went to BET, um, Hot 97. We had Angela Yee from The Breakfast Club come into our class. We went to uh, The Source, Vibe, like literally wow. all these huge companies or staples in the hip-hop community and like management type of space. Um, we went to them or people will come in to us. So that was a great opportunity to meet people. And then they obviously like challenged us in other ways. We had homework assignments. Um, we ended up getting to work for Russell Simmons, um, one of his charity events, which was super dope. Um, and yeah, it, so that experience alone opened the world to like my eyes, sorry, to American well, not even American, just like the way the music industry really is, right? In the entertainment yeah. world. Um, I got to learn so much and like who's who, because being here, like, I, and not being around these people, like I might not know, right? So a lot of my ween sisters, they knew who some of these people were because like, they'd be out and about and it was just natural for them to know who the A&R of this person was, or whatever. So I like had to kind of catch up with that. Um, but overall, that actually helped me get my like work visa because during the confessionals for the reality show, um, every night we had to do confessionals. And during one of mine, I said, like, I refuse to leave New York until I get a work visa. So I'm like, I don't know what I have to do. I don't know who I'm going to have to meet. But like, I'm not leaving until it happens. So the founder, Sabrina, she saw my confessional and she was just like, hey, Ace, like, I think you're so dope. How can I help you? Like, how can I be of service? So she connected me to a bunch of people. Um, this one lady named Sharice, who used to work for my last company, Radio One, she was just like, you're dope, I'm gonna find a way to hire you, and we'll figure this out. Wow. So yeah, she helped me um, get into the door for Radio One. I was originally supposed to move to Richmond, I ended up in Detroit. Um, but yeah, she kinda like helped me. So without that program, like I don't think you, I don't know, like, if it was destined for me to be there, then, you know, it's destined. But that program really, like, helps me. Yeah. I thank them. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I was even, like, on their website today, and there's, yeah. like, a picture of you, like, right there. Was there? On their website, yeah. Is there really? I haven't been on yeah, the on website. On the front page. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I have not been on the website in forever. Like, I know that they're very proud of me because they always, you know, when they're connecting me with, like, connecting like future people they'll be like oh yeah you should talk to ace so many girls dm me asking mm. me questions about it 
um and yeah they'll like connect me to other people be like hey do you have advice um can you look this over for me like so i definitely know that they care about me so yeah i think i'm one of their faves <laughs> I think. Um, tell me about American radio because, like, I think I feel like so many people wouldn't really grasp like yeah. how fast paced and how like serious it is there compared to listening to radio stations here, where it's like such more more traditional format. And it's not as like yeah. sort of like um, not as contemporary. I feel like as like American like rap, radio like in media, or I feel like they're they're trying to be like in tune with stuff. Yeah. Um, it's definitely different and what I've realized is that it's really localized so I was in Detroit and Detroit radio is so much different from New York radio and it's so much different from Richmond Virginia radio yeah. right because um, it's like it, it picks up on their lifestyle so you'll get songs from the Midwest like artists from the Midwest specifically Detroit played more everybody has a different sound every program director programs different and allows certain things um what i've realized from here to there is the talk breaks are longer they allow mm. for um i guess like less structured uh radio um and there's always somebody there like when i worked in detroit i wasn't on air um i did fill in on the morning show sometimes but my specific role was online editor so i managed all the websites social media all that stuff and I would record the interviews and stuff like that for people behind the scenes. And there would be like different artists multiple times. Like sometimes we'd have like two, three artists or two, three people, whoever it was, a day coming through the station. Like, yeah. so it's definitely different compared to here and how many artists come through the building. And even like with record reps, like the record reps would come to the station all the time. They were always there. They would live in the station. I feel like they would work there. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely a different landscape. Landscape, um, just because there's more. Uh, I don't know what to call it. I don't know what to say about it, but yeah, there's just more. It's also just a <laughs> way bigger there's industry more, there. Yeah, yeah, and so it's it's just different. Deeper rooted, I think, to like the infrastructure. Absolutely. So like mm -hmm. it's like a radio is like a part of a lot of other things. Yeah, and even with the listeners, like radio stations do like shows that, like more in the state. I feel like that's like a thing too. They like do being, in, like, being involved in like live events like a lot more. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, um, out in the culture, not just like at the station. I think that it just depends on where you are realistically. Like I can only specifically speak on Detroit. Um, and Detroit was definitely literally in the streets, but like Hot 107.5 was in the streets, but then you go to the competition, WJLB, and they weren't in the streets as much. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of yeah. like whatever company owns yours, Hot 107.5 was owned by black people. Like, it's a black-owned company. So they're going to definitely get the culture more than, like, iHeart, who is just corporate and have a different perspective on yeah. things. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it, there's uh, variances of, like, wh who's where and whatever the case might be. But even with radio in general, like, for Detroit specifically, like, the way that listeners utilize radio like it's such a big thing there like they love to listen to their radio they love to show up at like events and broadcast mm. and just be up all in a business and stuff like that and i think it just depends on like who the people are like the the, the audience right yeah because i'm sure not all markets are like that yeah um what do you, what do you think that your favorite um, interview was because I know you got to interview like tons of artists when you're working in the states. Like I, yeah. I, I, I watched um, your interview with um, with her. Yeah, like that's crazy. Like that, I mean, <laughs> you watched the interview with like Bryson Tiller. Like it's like so yeah. rare. Yeah. Um, actually, I guess Bryson Tiller was when you were here though. Yeah, Bryson Tiller was here. Um, it was a phone interview, so I've still never met Bryson Tiller in person. Uh, her was really dope just because that was actually her first on-camera interview. Like, I know there was somebody who said that they did an on-camera interview with her before, um, but mine was the first one. Even though you can't see her face, <laughs> because she was, like, sitting, she was, like, the camera was from behind. I was the first one, so there's that. And from that interview, she actually, the next time I saw her in concert, she was like, oh, my gosh, I remember you from, like, that interview we did. It was so dope. It was so much fun. Um, but, yeah, I think my favorite interview was Dave East. 
And that's just because I did watch that. <laughs> I did watch that. Yeah. That Please was talk like about my that. Most popular <laughs> interview. And um, it was just a good time. I didn't expect a lot of the things. First of all, Dave East is fine. So <laughs> I was just like nervous because he is so fine. And he had all his boys in the room. It was just like 20 people, I felt like, just in the room, this small room. And I was like, oh, my gosh, y'all can't leave. Like, can we just do this interview by ourselves? And so, yeah, uh, the premise of it was he had so many other interviews with the jocks that day. And so I didn't want to ask the same stuff that they were doing. So I did a yeah. shoot your shot since, you know, a lot of ladies love him. Shoot your shot. What would you do if you're what are you watching if you're Netflix and chilling? Like, where would you go on um, a vacation? Stuff like that. And then I asked him the best question ever. Like, what song are you singing in <laughs> the show? <shower? laughs> And his response just, like, threw me off. But I felt like I handled it well. Um, he said, Akinelli, you put it in your mouth. And I was like, oh. Makes sense. I mean. <laughs> it's those moments I that really, it. truly test you. If you can sort of, like, keep. I was just like, oh. <laughs> okay. That's where we. Cool. Bet. Um. But that interview was so much fun. I, I loved it. I knew I had, like, gold. And so when I posted on YouTube, I ended up, like, doing numbers. He actually ended up posting it on his Instagram as well. And, like, the comments are just so crazy. So many people are disrespectful. Yeah. And I'm just like, whatever. At first, I was annoyed and I would respond back. But now it's, it's okay. I actually went to the BET Awards. And this was, like... Oh, wow. This was like six months after I recorded that interview and somebody came up to me and they're like, aren't you the girl that interviewed Davies? And he said, put it in your mouth. And I was like, uh, that's me. <laughs> I guess you don't just get to choose what you're famous for. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's so funny. So yeah, that one's definitely my favorite. And then I guess the most, um, I guess the most legendary one is Ice Cube. And that was here. But yeah. Because he was probably a movie, right, when he was here? No, it was for um, the big three. Oh, the basketball, basketball league. league. Yeah. But he was He's so got nice. so many different, like, ventures. Yeah. <laughs> he's, like, all over the place. Go ahead, Ice Cube. Did but you hear he's trying to, like, get a conglomerate of, like, big, big black business owners to buy up all the media companies? Like, buy up, like, the, like buy up Disney and, like, buy up, like, all these oh, major he? media companies. And he wants to, like, get a bunch of people together. That'd be dope. That'd be dope. That'd be crazy just to flip things like on his head completely. Absolutely. Because I mean, half the time these people are biting from the culture and the culture is black culture. So it's like, have black people run it and it would probably be like so much better. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it wouldn't be so like, oh, okay, now I'm in trouble because like black Twitter is getting it on me because. You wouldn't have to have these, <laughs> you wouldn't have these like, these like cliche moments where it's like no. a board table of white people and they're like, oh, we have to like call in like the one black person we know to come and make sure this isn't like corny. Right? Have you ever, well, yeah, have you ever watched Insecure? No. Okay, so Insecure with Issa Rae, she's like the only black person at this company that she works for, right? Oh. And so one of the scenes was her sitting at the table and like these white people are going around the corner talking about, I just don't, like I just think that it's offensive, this logo's offensive, da 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 da. They just kept going and she's just sitting there in her head and then they throw it to her. They're like, well, we should ask Issa. And she was just like, I hate it, like, you're racist as hell, da 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 Like, in her head, she's saying it. Yeah, yeah. What she says is, it's fine. Oh, uh, yeah. But it's just like, she, in her head, she was just like, I hate being the only black person. I hate, yeah. the, like, going being the go-to. Why can't you just hire more black people, and then we wouldn't have to have the discussion because you would know off the bat that this is racist as hell. And I'm just like, that's pretty much how most, like, scenarios happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's definitely a difference, though. Um, is there anything you miss about working in the States? Because now you've been back home for a bit now. Yeah. Is there anything that's sort of, like, still in the back of your head you, like, really miss? Yeah, I think I just miss the culture. Um, Detroit has such a different culture in general. And at first, it took me a while to get, like, used to it. Because I'm like, this is foreign. I've lived in New York. I lived in D.C. Like, it's just not this, right? Um, but I miss the culture because everybody was just so like like fun <laughs> like it was genuine right um i think living in a city like toronto there's a lot of 
like, oh, I'm going to do this because it's an industry thing. And I feel like I need to be a part of this industry. So I just don't think it's a lot of, of genuine relationships. More like, let me do this to show face and try to be popular and clout chase. That's just me being honest um, compared to there where it's like, hey, let's go here because we're going to turn up and have a, an amazing time. And because yeah. we want to support the person. Like, yeah. their support system is crazy. Like, if you... Like, there's this one uh, jock on air, DJ BJ. He, he's a full-time radio host, okay? He's a DJ. He has, like, um, what's it called? Like, live, like, showcases, like, talent show type things. He has a clothing line. He's, in like, a producer now. And everybody will support it. Like, I have went and, like, just bought shirts. He has, like, a fashion truck where he drives around and just parks it somewhere in Detroit. That's and it has sick. all of his, like, clothes, his T-shirts and sweaters <laughs> and stuff and hats. And I would just pull up and, like, buy stuff from him because I supported him. And I knew that whatever I had, like, he would be there to support me. And that's just how yeah. it was. Like, it wasn't like, oh, can I have it for free just because? Yeah. Right, That's like it's such like a thing I, here, right? Yeah, and it's like it was like, yo, I'm doing this because I really support you. Yeah, yeah. That's so funny. Yeah, that's such a thing here. It's like people now. It's like they're gonna do merch or they're gonna do something, and it's like, yo, like this is my address or like yeah. XL. Yeah. This is my way. <laughs> like, or, but like, I didn't with, make these to give them away. <laughs> yeah, but even with events, right? Um, yeah, like asking for guest list on like ten dollar events. Yeah, <laughs> but even. With me, I did my brunch, my Just Ace brunch in January, and like everybody got so much stuff from free food to free alcohol to like these crazy gift bags and stuff like that. And I was like, no, I have to have everything free. Like I can't charge anybody because I felt like everybody's so accustomed to um, not having stuff, like not having to pay for stuff that if I did have a ticket price, then they wouldn't come. And I kind of saw that because once I did my paint and sip in March, most of the people that showed up, my event sold out, but most of the people that showed up, I didn't know. I probably knew like five people that actually bought huh. tickets out of 40. These are people I don't know. So and it's like, was it because it's $50 ticket? But also you do get free dessert, you get drinks, you get the supplies to paint, whatever. Huh. So yeah i definitely feel like that i'm very conscious like i feel like we're too spoiled here in toronto huh that's funny <laughs> speaking of being spoiled in toronto um i usually i wish we had more time for this but you have to um i usually end this with um okay. asking people of two food recommendations maybe something a little more low-key and then something like a little more obvious two food rec recommendations yeah. i'm gonna plug my cousin's bar because you see him be supportive. Yeah, yeah, um, of course. <laughs> so my cousin has this bar called Come See Me. It's on college. It actually has food. Um, it's, like, really good. Like, they have this one thing. It's kind of, it's a mix of, like, regular bar food with a little bit of spin of, there's, like, Caribbean influences as well as, like, Southern influences. Um, I love the Yardy salad. So it's a jerk chicken Caesar salad so good and it has like plantain chips in it so that was really good and they also have the plug poutine which is like regular fries poutine with mixed with sweet potato fries and i think mm. like the gravy has like a little bit of jerk sauce in it and yeah they have like other things like a chicken and waffle like like sandwich and stuff like that so yeah come see me on college street uh it's really good i like that one and Dang, this is hard. A few moments later. Okay, one more. A starving artist. Do you know what it is? Like, I love waffles. So he has a breakfast artist, spot, right? Yeah, I don't know if it's open all day or not, but like their premise is waffles, and they have like sweet potato waffles, and there's a few locations. I think like college. Where's another one? More west, um, bluer or something like that. Or no. I don't know. Davenport? I don't know. It's more West. You got to search it up. But Starving Artist is really, really good. I love, love it. Oh, my gosh. I want to go there. Okay. Shout out to Starving Artist. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for doing this. No I problem. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, could you... Usually I would just sign this off myself, but I'm wondering if you could tell people, like, you know, you're, you know, you're like, go to 
every day. You know what I'm talking about? What when I sign out? No, and you like oh. you know when you like start the day. There's like a, your oh, go to. Yeah. I wonder if you wonder if you could like sign off with that. How? It's not morning. <laughs> I guess it's not. I guess it's not morning. I guess. Because I'm usually like good morning. That one or my Instagram one. There's two different ones. We gotta. Yeah, okay, just give it, I need it for the people though. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thank you for having me, first of all. Second of all, Ace is out of this place, and I hope you have a positive and productive day. <laughs>